Well, I think we'll make a start. I trust that you can hear me. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar, which is hosted by the IET North Yorkshire. I'm Paul Broadberry, and I'm the vice chair of the North Yorkshire Local Network. The IET, in case you're not aware, is a UK registered charity with about 160,000 members worldwide. And we local networks get budget every year from the centre to put on events such as this. And we run these events for people of all ages, whether they're members or not members. But the idea is to promote interest in science, engineering and technology. Now, if you're local to North Yorkshire and you'd like to volunteer, we would love to hear from you. But of course, the word local, well, we're broadcasting over the internet. So local in this case, potentially meet worldwide. So probably I should say, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And if you're in Asia, I'm sorry that you have to stay up so late to watch this. I'm delighted to introduce my friend, Dr. Simon Holland, whose small enterprise, Barefoot Lightning, undertakes the development of app-based decision support tools in collaboration with universities and government agencies, both in the UK and overseas, to support smallholders in Asia and Africa, and whose promise of an interesting talk has brought us to this moment. We're aiming to present for about 30 minutes with about 15 minutes of questions at the end. You should, if you move your mouse, you may see a question button at the bottom of your screen. And if you want to submit a question, please type it in there. It'll come up on my queue. And when we get to the end, I'll pick some interesting ones and read them out as time permits. And just to let you know, we are recording. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'll just share my screen and get this started. Okay, so the title, what, what is a decision? And the secrets of decision support through to action. So that clearly is going to be my view of the world and um, how I view we can move these things forward. But what I will do is take you through some of the things that we see as the challenges in decision making, as well as also uh, so some, a few little frameworks um, that, that other decision scientists have developed over the years, just to give an idea how we can think about structuring that before I show you the type of solutions that we've been working on to help farmers in developing countries. So, hold on. So, if we look at the choices beyond before us, it's, it's not always clear what that choice is. And if we try and understand, is this a decision or is this, this a choice? I, I could be the rabbit there looking around deciding which carrot am I going to eat? Or I might actually be deciding how on earth am I going to get over all of these carrots? Or how many carrots can I eat before I'm full? There are lots of different choices or, or decisions that I can make. And the, the, the point of a decision is that actually it's when you start digging underneath and framing the decision that you've got to make. That's when you go through, you get information. So is this carrot rotten? Is this carrot too big for me to eat? Th those are the type of information that you need in order to make it a decision, rather than something that is a little bit more emotional, which is a choice of just, okay, I'll have that one. Okay. So, so if we look at some of the barriers to, to actually getting people or supporting people through decisions, if they don't know what's in front of them, they're not going to move forwards because there's always a fear of the unknown, fear of change. And especially with the farmers we deal with, that their livelihoods depend on, on getting a result at the end of the season. And anything that they fear could, could actually cause that not to happen is going to stop them from taking any action. Now, you might be able to sweeten that by showing them actually there is something of interest for you there. But, but that really depends on how you can get that information across to them and, and actually persuade them that, 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 that actually they're making the right sort of choice. So obviously, if it's the blind leading the blind, if we don't 
have good information and we're not able to structure it and make it accessible to people, we're not actually going to get them through that decision process. One of the challenges though, if we want to try and get information and structure it to support people is there is so much information out there at the moment. If you look at the World Health Organization, they've been running various various workshops globally to try and understand how to manage what they term the infodemic. And I'm sure a few of us have seen that term on the news now. But the issue is there's lots of information out there. You don't always know what information is good and you don't always know which is the best source for the information. So it's very, very important to try and structure that information and for that information to come from a trusted source. Another thing which is a challenge in actually getting people to take action on decisions, and again, this is we might know the course of action that we believe people should take, but if we just announce that to them, we just tell them, here is the thing you've got to do, without really giving them information to make a choice, what, what you're going to have is people who become quite resistant to change. And so it's very, very important to get the message across of, what are the options there that, that, that you can actually use in, in your decision making and really try and incorporate people in making a choice themselves? Because that emotional choice where, where people actually have feel they've seen enough information, that after seeing that information, they can then take a choice themselves, they become bought into that. And when they're bought into that, it means that they're likely to move forwards and actually take action on the choice or the decision that they've made. So, so let me talk now a little bit about some decision frameworks. And these are not ours, but um, I, I actually took the opportunity to learn a little bit more myself about decision frameworks in, in order to, 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 to see, you know, what are the steps that we've unwittingly gone through as we've been developing our tools and um, see even if we could learn a little bit more how to keep improving what we're doing. So if we look at decision making, uh, and this sort of captures a number of the issues I was talking about before, the very first thing you've got to do is identify the decision. You've got to know what is the thing that you're looking for. And then you've got to go through an exercise of gathering information. And after you gather this information, that is going to give you a number of different alternatives, different choices. And you, you may now get to the point where you need to build in some context, your specific context as to how these choices impact you. Maybe one is the out and out best solution but it's also very expensive. So you've got to weigh that up. And it's not just about the evidence, it's also about how that choice suits you, okay? And that's really starting to get us to this choosing now, which, which does become also, I've weighed the evidence, it starts to be more on that emotional side now. And you'll see that when I, I share just another view of the data and how it works. So, so then the goal that we really want to get people towards is taking action. Because having lots of information, if you don't do anything with it, is of absolutely no use at all. And of course, if you look at any world where you've made a decision and a choice, and it's an, the same choice you might come up against again in a year's time, you want to be able to review that information and try and learn something from it. So I'm going to show you now a little bit of a more detailed view of what data looks like and the process that it goes as you're making decisions. So, uh, and again, this is another framework that I found that I quite like. So if we look at data at the start, okay, so, so we can think of that as facts. Um, we could actually be trying to differentiate between the alternative facts, if you like, uh, well, as we're trying to actually get this pool of data there ready to start our process. Okay. So, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to structure that data so it makes a bit more sense to us. We can group the data together and start to put some logic around it. We also need to put a context around that. And I'll show you a little bit of some of the context um, definitions that, that we've been doing in our farming situations. But, but, but we need something, you know, 
what what is my affordability for example that also adds to the context as well as other information and for, for, for example if i'm talking about cleaning uh in a farm if i have an earthen or a dirt floor it's a completely different answer than if i have a concrete floor which is a different answer if i have a slatted floor which basically is a floor with holes where i can wash any of the waste through so so, so we need to do that contextual part as well. Now, now we start getting to the human intervention side where we've captured all of our data and now we start thinking about it and trying to put some wisdom in there. Uh, and again, this is trying to, in our case, trying to say really what are those choices, okay? So now, now an opinion, the emotional part, starts to get me through to the decision this is the choice that's suited to me. I want to take it. And if I've got my objectives, so, so my objectives are I do want to do this. I want to make more money through doing this or I want to make sure I don't have a disaster going through. That's the thing that now starts me getting through to action. Okay, and if I start reviewing, I get further experience. I add to my expertise as well. And these two things help to really strengthen how we get to the insight and the decision component then. So it's a little bit more of a conceptual tool, but, but I quite like this because it gives you a, a view of the different forms of data. And if you look in terms of how people evaluate these, people talk sometimes about second order data, third order data, and fourth order data, and that being the intelligence that's in the data. So. Uh, I find this quite nice that, that now I know the difference between data, information, and knowledge, and, and even the insights. Now, a final thing that um, I, I think is quite interesting when you look at how the development of software and tools are going, I'm sure we've all heard about big data, but big data actually, it, it covers up to the first, second, and third order of data. It, it potentially can start to get towards this fourth order of data and some people will say it makes decisions but but most things about the decisions are that they they have an emotional component and quite often a future looking component and so you're starting to get into a, a world which um uh, again for this particular model i found quite interesting is now talking about decision engineering okay so so you can think almost the big data becoming the platform. So, so, so the first thing we've got to do in any of these very high-end decision support systems is we've got to look at collecting the base data. Uh, ideally, we'll go through this sort of big data stages where we've got our data structured and we can continue to learn and create insight from that. But we've also got to think really about how we enable people to make decisions. And that's where this decision engineering part, if you like, comes in. Uh, I'm not going to talk any more on conceptual frameworks. I, I'm going to now give you a little bit more of our particular context in the farming sector. And in particular, in relation to animal husbandry. So the, the way I'd like to do that is just to show some of the farms we visited. So, so this is a farm in Ethiopia, and you, you see some goats here eating from a, a small bowl. Uh, you can see some legs here, and that actually is the legs of uh, a few cows they've got in some of the other sheds. So, so the, the context here, you can look at the floor, um, look at the animals and the weight of the animal. You, you can see this one here is actually its ribs are showing, so it's not getting the best nutrition at the moment. Uh, if I look here now, this is in Kenya. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but the cows on the first page look a lot like the cow you might see in a milker advert. So uh, your nice dairy cattle that, that, that we get in the West. These animals here are something called a zebu species. Uh, and these are the local indigenous animals from Africa, from uh, India. They're very, very resilient animals. Okay, they're, they're used to living through drought. But, but the very interesting thing here with these type of animals is because they're used to surviving drought, they tend to conserve water. All right. So over the years, their natural genetic selection 
has made them very efficient at surviving in drought conditions, but, but it, the natural selection means that the milk productivity is much, much lower than the European breeds where people have really selectively bred to try and increase the milk production in conditions where they've very rarely been, been either water or, or food um, shortage. Uh, I, I think here, if we, if we look at this, you, you see this is a little bit of a slightly ramshackle area. You can look inside, you can't quite see that, but you probably get a sense that the conditions are quite dirty. Uh, if we look at this next structure, uh, again, this is in Kenya. What, what, what you see is it's a much more robust structure. Okay. The chances of um, the floor being clean, so, so capturing, ca catching diseases from, from the floor, are lower in this context. And um, if we look at the, the, the previous uh, image as well, these cattle are actually just returning from having been out on a route that they've now learned to follow themselves where they walk along the highway they eat the grass verges they come back so their exposure to ticks and other um, disease threats is far far more significant than this animal in a very very solid corral okay uh, also in, in in Malawi now um, we have also some very big structured um, units on, on the larger farms. So all of these farms have different management requirements. Uh, here again, we're looking at um, now mixed breed. So this one is a mix between a European breed and a local breed. Okay. And to some extent, you get a bit of the best of both worlds when you get a hybrid like that. But the amount of food you need, the amount of water you need, is incredibly dependent on the likely production that an animal itself is capable of doing. So all of these contextual things are very, very important to capture. Uh, again, some, some other breeds, and this is in a large farm now, where still they're looking at uh, mixing different breeds. And there are a number of different ways people go around this, um, from, from having a, a direct breeding program to having artificial insemination. and um, even now, there is a group in Cheshire in, um, in the UK who are exporting fertilized embryos so that they can do a changeover of a breed incredibly rapidly in order to get very good characteristics. Uh, this is a little bit um, of a different look at the different ways people are feeding. So, so we've got a trough here outside. Uh, Another nice little thing is what are some of the supplements people give? So, so, so here we've got, um, I think it's papaya there. It's some sort of fruit anyway. And I, I learned from the scientist who was traveling with us then that, that this type of little sugary feed is very, very good for getting the digestion and the rumination going in the cows. So all of a sudden we're getting lots and lots of information about the, the context and the feed and the supplements. Where, where, you know, we've gone through this process of feeling completely overwhelmed by the information. And the only way we could get through this is by doing a lot of structuring. Uh, th this, again, is a, another local habit of hanging up the, um, the, 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 the straw harvest, if you like. And the reason for this is that um, some of the deer and goats come and eat all the supplies. So they have to hang it up uh, out of reach of the local animals that can get through and uh, eat that for them. Okay, so, so, so that's given a bit of my view on the sort of the challenges faced. And uh, a lot of those are around communication and decision support. Uh, some view of some of the structures that, that you can use to try and understand how to make decisions. And then some of the context that we've been dealing with in trying to develop the solutions that, that we're going to provide to the farmers in, in the various different countries that we work in. Okay, so, so if I start now giving you a view of what our solutions look like, the first thing we had to do was decide how at a high level were we going to structure this. And we also needed to look at where the farmers have knowledge themselves and where they really need knowledge to help them do a much more effective job. 
And so a big component of that is around the health of the animals. Uh, a massive component in terms of the economics is around the feed and nutrition. And then in terms of the health, the biosecurity, the getting the productivity up, that the farm and animal management becomes a critical component there. And that also is how we try and assess the context. So the type of shelter that the animals have, the type of flooring that, that, that we have, in order to really understand what is the system so that we can target and start to give the best advice for that. Okay, so I'm going to now look a little bit at, at how we structure content. And um, if I show you these slides, so, so, so I mentioned we, we use animations. So, so ignore the buttons on the top. This, this is a later structure. But, but we have animation content that will explain to a farmer the, the background behind a problem that we're talking about or an issue that we're trying to face. It then gives some of the options that the, 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 the farmer can actually choose. And so the farmer may choose a number of those options. And that is actually getting the farmer to go through some sort of decision process. Because we've done a lot of work to, first of all, find the information, understand the decisions that we need to make, then go even deeper into those, those decisions. Uh, in this case, about biosecurity. Um, after we go through the, the, the deeper review of that information, we start to come up with some structured options and choices. And then to really communicate that to the farmer so they can make a choice, we, we have to try and understand the pros and cons of those different choices in those different contexts for the farmers. And so it's quite a complex thing we've been trying to do, but, but we've gone through and developed a lot of structures to, to do this. So if I, I look at what some of that content looks like, uh, we, we have animation content, in this case on biosecurity uh, and wild boars and how to have um, boar-proof boar fences even, as well as some of the challenges with wild animals coming into the contact with the pit, your, your pigs in this case. Uh, so, so that's biosecurity. We've also done a lot of work on the welfare for the animals. So. One of the particular concerns we have is how do we get farmers to make choices that, that help look after the welfare of the animals as well as the economics of the farm? And it's completely possible to do both, but, but the barrier to doing that quite often is knowledge. And so, for, for, for example, the, the issue here really is tail biting. Now, now, people, when they talk about a practice, they often talk about tail docking which is the thing in the middle and now banned in the UK, I think banned in Europe as well, but, but still widely practiced in other regions. And the reason people do this is if the pigs bite each other's tails, the, the tail can get infected and that infection can go up the spine. Now, now what happens is a farmer continues to feed this pig, grows the pig to full market size, invested a lot of money and there is an invisible disease in the back of the pig, traveled throughout its nervous system. When that then goes to the abattoir, it's going to be spotted and the farmer is going to lose all of their income from that pig. So to avoid losing the income, they look at trying to avoid the tail biting. And the easiest way to do that, uh, especially in larger production systems, is to chop the tail off. But, but obviously that's quite a negative from an animal welfare perspective and um, and it's just not a very pleasant thing to do. The interesting thing is though that there is something called enrichment in farming. All right, What that is, it's about enriching the environment. Now, now you can do this with straw. If you put straw in a pig's um, uh, living area they will root around it. It's natural for them to root around, sniff things out with their noses. So if you put straw, and even if you put things like sweet potatoes for them to chew, they, they will chew those instead of chewing each other's tails when they're bored. And a, another solution is to have a rope or a chain that they can bite and chew instead of each other's tails. All of these things divert the pig's attention. But, but the issue for the farmers is, they frequently either don't know about these practices 
or they don't know why you would do it and what the benefits are. So, so that's where the animations allow us to really explain in quite short clips what are the different choices that you can make relating to tail biting and why would you even want to make a choice? Okay. And so when we explain all of that, now the farmer has that knowledge and emotionally they might care about the, the, the animal's welfare, they may not. Um, we have to put the tail docking as a choice. Uh, and now this is one that uh, so, so some of the welfare NGOs might not be very comfortable with us doing that. But if we don't put that as a choice and people are doing that practice, there, there are two things. We can't help them do it better for the pigs. But, but the other thing is we can't capture data to show that actually the welfare oriented choices are much better than the tail docking choice. And obviously that would be the holy grail if we can show that economically it's even better for you to look after the welfare of the animals. So there's an awful lot of information that we can impart through these simple animations before going to these type of decision choices for the farmers. Okay. So suppose the farmers made these choices now. Okay. And we also have choices on things like vaccinations and, and other things. That's not the end of it because that's just, okay, I have an idea I want to make this choice or this decision, but if I don't do anything, I haven't really made a decision. I haven't acted on it. Uh, and in order to make a decision, you really need to get to that action point. So um, just skip through to the next one. So, You've seen the type of practices and decision support tools we have there. And we have a number of content areas and um, we, we work through these with the farmers, either a, a selection of those when they first start using our tool. And we, we're still trying to decide whether we want to give this in chunks or really go all the way through. And I think we this is where we still got a lot of learning ourselves on how best to get this to encourage the farmers to a go through all of those choices and decisions and, and b you know just not lose their interest as they're going through because if they want to do a very effective job there are so many different areas that we cover through breeding and reproduction uh cleaning and hygiene and sanitation so that there's a lot we need to do there. So um, let, let me just move through to the next part. So, so, so now we've made this selection, okay? We've made a choice. The next thing we do is we push that into a different diary or calendar type structure. And so some of those things may be seasonal. So for example, when the rains come, you may get more flies, you now have disease issues. So you may need to do a vaccine shot, okay? They may be life cycle related. So, um, uh, 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 and I think I've got an example of this later, but, but in the early days of a pig's life cycle, you need to observe the pig and look to see if it's got a hernia, uh, especially if you've got interbreeding going on. So, 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 so there are different ways that we need to structure that data. And there are some daily repetitive tasks. You may do your cleaning twice a week. You may do it every Friday. So, so it's important to try and think about how you're going to structure that data, first of all, then. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the pig's life cycle. So obviously, I, I might have several pigs of different ages. And so uh, this particular pig or pen register is for much larger farmers. It's a little bit more textual. But, but we've got a simplified version for our smaller farmers that we work with. But now by knowing about the timing of, a, of an event or the context of that event, as well as the animals themselves, we now can go through and get to a list of daily activities. So, so from the choices, we go to the calendar, from the list of animals combined with the calendar, we can get a list of daily activities. And again, one thing that we're still going through is looking at how we keep this as simple as possible. If you have a lot of pigs, you don't want, or, or, or a lot of pens, you don't want to be saying, I did this activity in this pen for this pig and do that for 2000 pigs. Uh, it, it's just not manageable. So how we consolidate the decisions to say, okay, I've done these four activities across this wing of a particular pen 
becomes quite important as well. And now once I've got my daily activities uh, and I said, okay, yes, I've signed all of those, we automatically feed through to a farm diary, which then automatically feeds through to the pig and pen register. So, so we have a complete cycle now. And once we've done the initial setup, it all pretty much runs like clockwork itself to manage the animals, provide guidance to farmers, and also to capture data that you can use in a traceability and tracking system, for example. Okay, so that was a little bit about one form of decision making where we're really giving a lot of information and advice to farmers on how to manage the day-to-day -day activities, okay? There's another type of, of decision that, that we work with relating to the health. So suppose my animals are not well, then, then, then I have to react to that, okay? And, and I'll show you how we've done some work to start structuring how we can help farmers through that as well, okay? So, um, no, sorry, one sec. Um, right, so, so, hold on. So, so what we did, and we did this first in poultry in Ethiopia, and then we repeated the structure for pigs because it seemed to work quite well. Um, what we discovered when we did this with poultry, we, we had eight different types of disease symptom that, that we were looking at. And we had about 80 symptoms that people could observe in, in poultry because Birds are a, a species that, that experience a lot of predation. They try and hide symptoms as much as possible. Okay. Uh, when we moved to working with pigs, and this was now in Kenya, uh, we, we, we discovered that, that we've got a lot more symptoms we had to structure. So instead of having, you know, 10 symptoms in each of our categories, we ended up with 284 symptoms for pigs. And that's a massive amount of information. Okay, so we again had to think about how to keep the structure as simple as possible. And what, what we did then was we have done, for example, in head and eyes, this now breaks down into head, eyes, and ears as three subsections. But let, let me show you how this data works now. So the, the, the way this structure works, and we always try to work with low literacy farmers, even though you can see text here, you can again play an animation, and the animation will explain the symptom. Okay. Uh, if again you want to hit the other side, we can show either an image bank or a video bank. So this shows the real condition. The, the difficulty with image banks is they don't always look obvious or you know if i had chicken number one in this case i might not think it's got the same condition as chicken number two which, which seems to be swollen lower down so 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 the animations really help people conceptually understand what they're looking for and then they're able to select a few of those choices okay and we could actually have one tick just to say i've seen it or two ticks is saying that's the most obvious symptom or the most common symptom that I'm seeing across my animals. So at the end of this, we can identify, and that is going to give us a symptomatic disease match. Okay. Now, the next part I'm gonna show you, we, we thought we would stop there. And very interestingly, we had a meeting in Kenya where we had a lot of government vets um, came along um, who were very keen to get excited and integrated with the system. And we had a lot of farmers come along. And the farmers were all saying, uh, we can't get a hold of vets. The vets are not trained to work with pigs. We desperately want this. And the government were saying, uh, but you can't do this. You, you, you can't give this information. Only a trained vet can go to what we were then calling a diagnosis. Okay. So we had a real standoff between the farmers demanding that they should be allowed to have this information and the government vets insisting that they couldn't have access to this information. So, you know, for us, this was quite heartbreaking. We put a lot of effort into trying to, to, to work through the difficulties of supporting decision identification 
and all of a sudden we were getting road blocked by the government. So that actually brought about a quite nice step and I'll show you what that next step is now. So what we then looked at is we said, okay, if we can't do that, how, how do we build the system slightly differently? And so what you've just seen, okay, the farmer observing their animals, putting in some information and getting a first disease match. Okay, so, so, so that's the steps that you'd seen already. Uh, what we said was, okay, so what should come next? And, and actually the next step that we went through is we said, okay, we want to try and refine this list a little bit. So we're going to now, instead of just being passive in, in, in the, the symptom identification, we're going to be active and we're going to ask the farmer a few more questions. And we got the video bank to do that. So we will show some questions or some symptoms that, that will help us really shorten and differentiate this list. And now we get to the end of that and we get an updated match. And we might go through this cycle a few times until we think we've got actually a good match in order to do something else. All right, so, so, so what's very interesting when I told you we had too many symptoms here, we now can look at the primary observable symptoms, shorten this list, and put some of the other symptoms at the next level. Okay, so, so, so what you're trying to do all the time, if you've got too much information, you're always looking at ways to try and simplify that. Okay, so, so let's assume our farm has got to the end of this cycle. So, so the next thing we said was, okay, well, if we can't do a diagnosis, how do we involve the vets? Okay, and so what we decided was the which we always thought we wanted to do to some extent, but now it became a major component of the, the, the project, is that we should share this disease match with the vets, as well as share the symptoms that the farmer has, A, observed themselves, and B, being prompted to, to, to observe, and C, said are not evident in the animals. So, so now the vet's got some information, they can review a case, uh, what we've tried to do is make it simple then for the vet to select a few more symptoms to send back some questions to the farmer. And the important thing here is to try and get an interaction going. So, so even if the vet knows, we really do want the vet as the first step to be a dialogue with the farmers to help building trust, as well as to make sure that, that, that we start to get towards a good diagnosis. So, so we're hoping the vet might even add some ad lib questions. So there's an option for them to type or record a question and send it back to the farmer. That then gets us to some more information the vet can review again and then decide on a course of action. So do I need to visit? Can I send an animal health worker to take a sample for a lab test? Or, or actually, am I ready now to do a clinical diagnosis based on the information I have? And that then could lead, one, once we get to the diagnosis, to a prescription going out to the farmer. Now, there are a lot of reasons we wanted to try and get this integration because if you look at where the farmers currently go, because they can't easily access vets because they're in rural areas, the vets are not always there or not always trained or won't come out to the small farmers, they often will go to what, what, what would be termed an agro vet store. So it's a local import store that has a stock of medicines. And one of the big issues with doing that is that, that you often get the wrong medicine or overprescribe the medicine, and it leads to antimicrobial resistance, and, or a AMR is the term that comes out there. And the reason this is an issue is because a lot of medicines you use for animals are the same medicines you use for humans. So actually trying to make this whole cycle work can have some very large implications, not only for animal health, but also for human health. Okay, so... Simon, may I just yeah. interrupt you briefly? I, I, I'm, it's very interesting. I just want to say we've had about 30 minutes so far. Sure, sure, sure. I'm closing towards the end now, Paul, don't you worry. Yeah, well, we, you're doing that <laughs> because we still have 163 people on, very, very few people have... Sure. Uh, and it's probably broadband problems that might be the reason why they've dropped off. But you know, mm. I just wanted to, to put that flag up for you. That sure, 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 sure. Okay, so, so, so if I continue on, so, so one of the things we wanted to do to try and make sure we could get adoption is minimize the, 
the, the, the time impact on the vets. So, so by minimizing the time impact on the vets, we, we could actually make the cost to the vet themselves quite low. And so the goal is the, the, to try and get farmers to move on to this, this type of system. We now make the vet consultation the price of a bus fare to and from my local village. So the farmer now starts to perceive this service as a, a valuable service that doesn't cost them too much to be able to do it. From the vet's perspective, they can potentially make the same revenue they would have made if they'd have gone out to a farm and traveled all the way in terms of the efficiency of the time. Okay. But also, they potentially have a channel for additional sales. Okay. So um, this is just an example of something which is not really decision oriented, but it's a best practice. And this is another use of the content. So, and this is a simple using a tennis ball to push a hernia back into a pig's stomach so it can heal and using tape. But, but I, I just wanted to differentiate, not all information you have is going to be about decisions. Some of it, I would term best practices. Okay. So um, just to get to Paul's point, so we're going through a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. We're not going to get it right all the time. But what is going to happen is we are going to keep learning. Okay. Uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you, Simon. That was a fast ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I learned how to quickly hide the rest of my slides without you noticing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for that. Um, I've known Simon a while now, and his talks are always extremely interesting. Uh, the danger for me is that I forget that I'm hosting and I get so absorbed in the talk. Anyway, <laughs> um, thank you, Simon. As promised, uh, we, we have a few questions. Mm. I'll deal with the easy ones first. Um, sure. Okay, so one person has asked, could we send this presentation together with the slides? Well, it is recorded, and I'll check with my IET colleagues just how we're going to publish it. And uh, mm. it, we've got people's email addresses because they registered. So by one means or another, we'll tell you how you can get access to the video. So that's sure. the first point. Um, the second point is about a continuing professional development certificate and same sort of answer I'll speak to the IT central employed paid team and, and figure out how we do that uh, and then we have uh, a couple of questions which are uh, more to the content of your talk mm -hmm. so I, I'll say the first name of the person so that they know that I'm covering their question sure um, and I hope I, I do apologize if I don't say this right your Selena asks who could better know their animals than the farmers <laughs> which I interpret to mean, Simon, you're coming along with all this tech. Sure. But farmers know their animals anyway. Don't they know what's best for their animals? Sure. So uh, I, think, I think that's completely true. And what, what happens is the farmer's knowledge of their animals, you can imagine is going to tell them this animal's not well. Right. And so spotting the animal's not well is step one in terms of trying to cure it. What the farmers don't tend to know is all of the diseases, right? Um, in, in fact, the vets quite often don't know all of the diseases and all of the symptoms. So what, what, what we have, the, the, there are quite a few what you might title are general symptoms, right? So in, in birds, you might get them huddling in a corner when they're sick. In animals, you might have them laying down or, or sh you know, looking a little bit shy, not eating. So, so, so some of those conditions can, can be quite general to lots and lots of different diseases. It doesn't actually tell you what to do. So, so the next thing that, that, that you want to do, so, so great that the farmer is very close to their animals and notices there's some issue, right? But the next thing is, okay, so what next? Um, and so the point of the tool is to try and help connect both the vets, but also give farmers more information that they don't necessarily have. And so, uh, again, some, sometimes the context is very important here as well. So with a lot of farmers we deal with, they're, they're very low literacy levels. And so 
part of the reason we created the content is we make the information now accessible. If, if you've got good Google search skills, then by all means, you might be able to go and find what the condition is and read a, a, a lot of papers. What, what we can do in our tool is we can help people guide along to what are the things I want to read in more detail quickly. Uh, another perspective, and, uh, and this is from Nigeria now, is, you know, so, so, so there are a lot of pastoral farmers there who might have a herd of 200 cattle that they drive across the changing landscape as the seasons change. And, um, you know, in one area, the grass is now ready for, for grazing. Uh, and over time, they need to migrate north or south a little bit to follow the seasons. And that can end up with them being two, three hundred kilometers from a vet or more. And now you've got a vet who is going to potentially have a telephone call with that farmer. As they have that telephone call, they're going to ask a few questions of the farmer. But some of these symptoms and conditions, it's incredibly difficult to explain it over the phone. All right. So what tends to happen, the vet will have a quick question. He'll pack his bag full of medicines. And quite often, the medicines need to be refrigerated. So there's a limit to how much the vet can take. And some of the vets are on a motorbike. Some of them are in a car. Right. And, um, you know, so, so quite often, if they've got to travel 200 kilometers over bad terrain, it might take them a day, could take them two days. They get all the way there. And if they now have not taken note of a few possible diseases that could be there, they might find they don't have the right medicine. OK, so the farmer is expecting them to treat the animal. They'll probably treat the animal, maybe get a bad outcome. Um, so, 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 so yes, the farmers should definitely be closer to their animals, know there's some problems and, and even for some of the common problems. So, so in pigs, you get a lot of, uh, diarrhea uh, and it's known as scours in when, when you're talking about pigs, but, but there are different versions of that. There are bacterial and there are viral. And obviously the treatment is very different depending on that. And, um, you, you know, there are all sorts then of different solutions that, that, that you can go through. And some of them even, which quite scared me when I heard this, but involve feeding feces to all of the pigs, trying to, trying to build up the, the, the famous herd immunity so that, that you wipe out the disease in that community and then you clear it out of the cycle. But, but you might you know, you might lose a lot of your young pigs, so you need to stop a few cycles. But so, so, so all these different types of practices and treatments also become important. And again, some vets in some countries will know these treatments and know these practices. Some won't. Some of them won't be very familiar with the pigs, for example, because in a lot of Africa, your your cows have been the far more dominant species, but the pigs are starting to grow a lot. So the vets just don't have that deep knowledge as much. Can I guide you a little bit? I mean, uh, uh, somebody's actually commented, the fact is we don't know what we don't know. As if we were farmers, we don't know what we don't mm. know. We don't always know the, the, the best. Yeah, that, that would have been the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I've just tried to, uh, thinking, we've got a few questions coming in and I'd like to try and do justice to, to all of them. Um, Peter said it's quite a long question. I'm going to read it out. It's a few sentences, mm -hmm. but I, I think I've got the sense of it. So uh, bear with me while I do this. Please. Sure. Simon. In my experience as an engineer, manager and entrepreneur, I find that the classic vector from decision need to action is clearly applicable only to administrators where complete and reliable facts are predominantly available. But at senior levels, re reliable information such as for future market, competitive or political states are often unavailable. So probably a probability and in, an intuition are substituted even though the possible penalties are higher. So the real sort of a bottom line question from Peter is, do you feel that the same classic vector still applies but needs to be more flexibly described? So I- Sure, so, so, so this is getting into the- 
this is getting into the complex area of decision science and uh, and I did see a few interesting frameworks and again I, I talked a little bit about the step between the big data and then moving to the decision engineering and uh, I used to do a lot of strategy consulting myself and what, what, what's interesting when you're doing that is you're gathering a lot of information you're structuring it but at the end of the day, you're giving it to a decision maker and that decision maker can be at any different level. It could be a farmer, right? And all that you can do is you can give the, them the information and try and turn that into structured knowledge mm. so that they can make the best choice that they feel is right for them. But at the end of the day, you know, unless you, you just go on a totally automated system, which you only really can do effectively for very simple systems, then somebody has to make that that choice based on you know the fit for me that emotional part and for senior management that emotional part is you know it, it's a gut feel quite often or it's taking into account some of that learning that they've got over the years of experiencing different things and just you know I think another great thing, you know, we always used to talk in our strategy about diversity. The more diversity you have in teams for decision making, the better the decisions you make. So that, the, you know, from our perspective, we can try and pull a lot of information from a lot of sources. So that's what we do when we're trying to frame the choices. But, but you know, as, as, as you move up to more complex decisions, I, I think that experience and emotion and gut feel become more and more important and I, I, I think that's why it gives you hope that AI will never take over everything yeah I mean I guess I guess I guess just to chip in there Simon I guess sure. it's you know computer decision making let's call it that is yeah hundred percent reliable because of the factors you've said mm. I think it's a numbers game isn't it and if you can help 80 percent of the people 80 percent sure. That might be. I'm just using numbers in my yeah, own. Yeah, you know, I, I think the eighty twenty rule is. Yeah. You, you know, we, we know we're not <laughs> going to get everybody to make decisions as well. What uh, another thing we look at are key influences. So you know, in a lot of the villages where we worked, the majority of the farmers will always look to the person they consider to be the progressive farmer in that village. Maybe they've got a bit more land, or they're a bit more experimental. And they'll see what that, that progressive farmer does. And then a year later, they might adopt it. So, so it's not, mm. not only that we're influencing the individual using our tools, mm. but we're hoping that that individual will influence other people as well. Okay. So let, let me move on to a... a sure. bit and, okay, let me say, I'm, I'm planning to end this at half past. So wherever you're watching, half past should be half past. I don't know what hour it will be, but it will be half past. So um, we've oh, got a question. I'll, I'll be briefer this, this time. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> question from Abby, uh, does the app work on the standard phone? And if it does even, do they, do they have sufficient mobile coverage in the places where you're using it? Sure. So, 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 so that, that, that's a very important thing we tried to design in right from the start. So in, in terms of the mobile coverage, once you've got the app loaded, it will work without network. Okay. Obviously, if you have to share information with a vet, you have to get into a network area, but, but you can run through all of the tools without any network connectivity whatsoever. Okay. Uh, in terms of a standard phone, so we, we've looked at the, we work on Android platform for developing countries because uh, for most of the farmers, I'd say 90 to 95% of the farmers have an Android phone, pro probably closer to 100, to be honest. Mm. Um, uh, and so we can go back, I think, to the fourth generation of Android when the number of phones that we're talking 10 years or more ago, the number of phones was really much lower. And most of those phones now have crashed out of existence. Okay. Uh, in terms of what you would call a function phone, uh, we wouldn't work on that, but that becomes the next phase. So whereas most people start with SMS services or IVR, which is uh, interactive voice response. That's where you call and you give a, you know, uh, my choice is blue or green or, you know, you, you answer some questions on the phone. So, so 
the, the reason we go into the detail is because that's where we build up the data in order to A, be able to profile people. So if we're trying to give people guidance as to what's the best solution to them, for people who are making a telephone call, we need to know how to quickly be able to profile them down and give them the most appropriate advice for them. And, and that's why we need this sort of deeper understanding that we can get from an app. Okay, but the, the, the bottom line seemed to be, um, it, it's on Android it work, and for, for, mm. even if they don't have coverage. It, it sure. Uh, and, and even when people talk about, okay, in some countries, you've only got 50-50 in terms of smartphones and function phones, that's going to be different in five years' time. Okay. And in 10 years' time, very different. All right. Let, 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 let me move yeah. on and try and capture a few more of these questions. Um, so Jez has asked us, to what extent is language uh, a barrier? So where language is... Um, language and knowledge are different. Sure. How do you deal with that with, with your app? Is it all in yeah. so, 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 so actually, uh, again, right from the start, we've designed to be able to switch languages over. So, so, so we can do, a, um, we can do a tr uh, an automated translation to 44 languages or so. Mm -hmm. but, but actually, the role of our local partner then is to polish those translations. And we, we, we can play an animation with either a text to voice where, where, where that functionality exists, or we can overlay a voice recording. And, uh, and we built all of that in because, because we are very aware that, that we really need to have that local language capability in all the markets we operate. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, sorry, I was just saying. We've got oh, yeah. far more questions than we're going to be able to cover. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right, okay, I'm going to go to Jonathan. So please don't be offended if I don't read out your question. I've got more than I can cover now, but I'll just go to jump. I've got two lists I'm working from as well. Sure. But anyway, uh, Jonathan asks, how often do decisions not match, match your initial assessment? And how do you avoid loss of credibility with misdiagnosis? So you come along with this app and the farmer says, you've got to be joking. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, so, 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 so uh, I, I think, you know, what, what we do, uh, and I didn't talk about actually um, that there were some bars like radio signals at the side, which were trying to show, I'm not going to use, I'm going to use the word probability, but I'm not going to mean oh, it. Okay. Yeah. It's not actually a probability in there, right? But what it's doing is it's giving you a list of the most probable diseases. And, and there's all sorts of other context things we need to build in, like, you know, the history of the animal, the genetics of the animal, some breeds are more susceptible or resistant to particular diseases. Some climatic data, the, the temperature, the humidity, all mm -hmm. of that we've not yeah. built in yet. And all of those things will improve that in the future. Mm -hmm. But also what we expect by having the vets in the loop is that we will learn from the final, final diagnosis that a vet makes. And that again will improve the system. So, um, so, so it is absolutely not going to be perfect. And what will happen is even if it was perfect and the farmer gets their animal treated, it may still be too late to save the animal. And some of them will point at us or blame us. So what, what, one of the things that we're looking at in some of the, the territories is how we have an integrated um, solution that, covers both our solution plus an insurance package. Oh, okay. And that way we, we, we can mitigate against A, some of the risk for the farmers, but, but B, if you're not following the practices, your insurance goes. So it helps encourage more take up of the practices as well, or at least of the practices that they've chosen. All right. Okay. If they don't choose many good practices over time, that probably will infect, impact the insurance premium. Mm -hmm. so, so again, there's an encouragement to adopt good practices. And then if it goes wrong, there's, there's an insurance component. I could, I could talk a lot about the insurance, but I know Paul is going to cut me off. So, wow. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to finish with one final question. I, I, there's 20 questions all together, which I'm not going to read out. And there's also, uh, there are also yeah. questions 
and through. If there is a way, Paul, to publish those at the end, I don't mind answering them in a text format. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, maybe I'll make sure I do a screen grab before. Um, sure. Before anyway, yeah. just one final question, and this is a yeah. straightforward question. Um, what they've asked is how long do you find it takes to develop an app? But I think maybe I'm <laughs> going to ask how long have you been working on this? <laughs> you don't want to know is the answer. Uh, okay. No, so so, so answer? Well, but what's interesting, we, we've done some simple apps, right? And, and this is by no means a simple app. And we, we can do very simple things. You, you know, some things you could turn around in a week. We, we, we have some friends who do a lot of meditation work. And all we're doing there is giving them, okay, what are the four or five steps in your meditation using an existing screen structure we have and just pumping in some content. And so pro probably the team could do that in three days even just with an idea how we would design it and then put it through. This type of big platform project, um, you, you know, our pig project's been going for two years. Right. Um, but that was built on a poultry project, which was a year and a half. So, so you can see to build the platform up and the understanding's taken a lot of time. Now, uh, we've been doing other projects simultaneously, but if you, you know, if you had an endless amount of um, focus and, you, you know, an effective small enough team that, that was capable enough, then, then for sure, yeah, I, I mean, taking the sort of things I'm imparting now, we've learned the hard way, but I, I think people could take this to another sector and do something in six months without too <clears throat> trouble. Okay, if it looked like I wasn't listening, well, it wasn't that. It was because I'm just screen grabbing because I know when we close this down, my screen's going to disappear. So sure, sure, sure. Screen grabbing. Um, I think, Simon, yeah. we'll leave it there. We've been on for about an hour. Um, sure. I would normally at this point ask for a vote of thanks in the usual way by clapping, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so I trust that everybody has, has enjoyed your presentation. I know certainly I have again, another one of your presentations. Um, oh. We have recorded it. So we will find a way to make it available. Uh, sure. We've still got 132 people on, even now. So, But I'm going to end it there. Uh, okay. So okay. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank, thanks so much, Paul, Bye. and thanks for the opportunity. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers.